In our today's lecture, we are going to talk about moral improvement and the topic of moral improvement is respect. In our today's lecture, we will discuss that why it is important to give respect and how we can earn respect. Well guys, receiving respect from others is important because it helps us to feel safe and express ourselves. Being respected by important people in our lives growing up teaches us how to be respectful, you know, towards others. Well, uh, respect means that you accept someone's, you know, the way they are, whether they are different from you and you don't agree with them. Always remember one thing guys, respect in our relationships builds feeling of trust safety and well-being and always always keep this thing in your mind that respect doesn't have to come naturally and this is something which you have to learn you know and at the end of this lecture i would like to say that uh, treat people the way you wanted to be treated talk to people the way you wanted to be talked because respect is 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 earned not given Before we start our today's assignment, it is really very important to recall our previous lecture. Guys, uh, this recall will help you to solve our today's assignment. In our previous lecture, I have discussed several things with you. For example, the explorers and the explorations. We have discussed few of our ancient explorers and few of our modern explorers. Well, guys, uh, history tells us that the most unique entity in whole universe is the planet Earth and human beings. Most unique characteristic of his his searching nature, you know, our our genetic ancestors have searched for their basic needs, for example, food and shelter. As time passed, human having satisfied, you know, their basic needs, they have searched for trade, resources, undiscovered areas, and information. This act of searching is called exploration. Exploration is the act of searching for the purpose of discovery as well as for the purpose of information and resources. Well, in our previous lecture, we have discussed about Marco Polo. Uh, in today's lecture, we will recall all of his important journeys and I'm providing you the link of few of the videos which will help out to understand more about Marco Polo. Marco Polo was a merchant and explorer who traveled throughout for the Far East and China for much of his life. He was born in Italy, Venice, uh, you know, in 1254 uh, AD. His father was also a merchant. Marco Polo uh, was only 17 years old when he left for China and for the first time. He met at uh, China at the, uh, you know, Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan during his first trip. So he became the, you can say, the messenger of Kublai Khan over there. He appointed him as, as one of his messenger. So by keeping that job, he traveled throughout the China. He observed the Chinese culture. That was really very helpful for him to understand the luxurious lifestyle of Chinese people. So he, he took, uh, you know, like uh, for th he took three years, you know, to, to, to reach China. So that was uh, one of the greatest exploration for his life. Let's watch a video which will be very helpful for you for you to recall the important points about Marco Polo and I'm also providing the link of that video inside the slide. Marco Polo? Thanks, Oscar. Hey Oscar. Marco Polo was a 13th century European merchant. He was from Venice, but he spent more than 20 years traveling around Asia. His adventures helped introduce many Europeans to the Far East. Back in the Middle Ages, Europe wasn't the global power it is today. Instead of a few dozen countries, it was broken up into hundreds of tiny kingdoms. They were centered around walled cities, more like towns by today's standards. Outside of those walls, it was a dangerous no-man's land. So in many places, people didn't engage much with the wider world. But Marco Polo's hometown of Venice was different. It was a city on the western end of the Silk Road. That was a network of trade routes connecting Europe to China. The Silk Road was 4,000 miles long, so few people made the full trip. Instead, they traveled to nearby cities to buy or sell goods. Products would pass from city to city this way, like a relay race. Marco's father and uncle had made a nice little fortune doing that. 
but they couldn't help but wonder about the lands that produced the goods they traded in. So, Niccolo and Maffeo set out on an adventure. They left a few months before Marco was even born. He grew up wondering if he'd ever have a chance to meet his father. That day finally came when he was 15. Niccolo and Maffeo told of how they'd befriended Kublai Khan, ruler of China. His vast kingdom, the Mongol Empire, covered half the continent of Asia. The Khan was also curious about other regions. He asked the Polos to bring back scholars to teach him about European culture. While they were home, they invited Marco to join the family business. And thus began his 24-year odyssey into Asia. Well, the reason we know all about Marco instead of his uncle and father is because he wrote a book. The tra reason we know all about Marco instead of his uncle and father is because he wrote a book. The travels of Marco Polo captivated readers with his incredible tales, like battling bandits, braving sandstorms, and encountering mythic beasts. A lot of that fantastic feel comes from Polo's co-author. Rusticello was a little-known author hoping to score a bestseller. He saw potential in Polo's travels, but wanted to inject them with action and drama. He was thinking more summer blockbuster than documentary film. The collection of tales was initially titled The Book of Marvels. I have told you that uh, Marco Polo told all of his you know, life journey and stories to one of his friends who was a writer. He just wrote all, all of his you know, stories inside the book. So we, in this video, we'll see that what kind of journey he observed. In southern China, there were monstrous water lizards with huge jaws. He even saw a strange beast that looked like a unicorn crossed with a pig. No, they weren't made up at all. He had just never seen tigers before, or crocodiles, or rhinos, and neither had his readers. They loved the exotic details, especially when it came to the Khan's lavish life. Twelve thousand knights guarded his marble and gold palace, and each day he was presented with treasure from every corner of his kingdom. Polo's eye for intriguing detail also impressed Kublai Khan. The kingdom was so vast that the Khan couldn't go visit all of it. So he sent Polo on exploratory missions to the farthest reaches of the empire. After returning, Marco would tell the king vivid stories of what he'd seen. I don't think a European king would have been so welcoming toward a Chinese traveler. But the Khan was surprisingly tolerant of different cultures. He allowed his subjects to practice their own religion and follow their own traditions. The Mongol civilization was ahead of its time in other ways, too. This period is known as the Age of Exploration. Many of its explorers, including Christopher Columbus, were inspired by Marco Polo. So, however much of the travels is made up, its impact is huge. Let's take a look about our next explorer. We have studied in our previous lesson that he has traveled for more than 30 years of his life and he was born in Tangier, Morocco on 24 February 1304. And now we are going to watch a video about him, so fasten your seat belts. A 21-year-old scholar mounted on a donkey leaves home for the first time. His objective, the holy city of Mecca. He expects to be gone for two years, possibly even three. I set out alone, he wrote later. Having neither fellow traveler in whose companionship I might find cheer, nor caravan whose part I might join, but swayed by an overmastering impulse within me, and a desire long cherished in my bosom to visit these illustrious sanctuaries. So I braced my resolution to quit my dear ones, female and male, and forsook my home as birds forsake their nests. And he will not return home for another twenty. certifications. He saw the great lighthouse of Alexandria, visited Cairo, which he called the mother of cities, passed by the Giza pyramids, 
and traveled down the Nile, but then was halted by a violent revolt. So he doubled back to Cairo and instead took the royal road to Damascus. Diverting for a moment to visit the tomb of Abraham, then the Muslim sites in Jerusalem, he finally made it to the Mamluk's second capital. But eager to move on, he only spent 24 days in Damascus, probably living in the dormitory of the Great Mosque. Though he did pack that three weeks full, managing to survive another illness, gaining further certifications, and celebrating Ramadan. Oh, and of course, you know, he got... Today's e-learning class, uh, we have seen the great achievements of Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta. I have shown you the videos to solve today's assignment. Let's move towards our today's assignment. After watching the detailed videos about Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta and their great discoveries, you have to tell me the answer of few of the questions okay, which are mentioned on the slides and few of the questions which I am going to ask you right now. First of all, you have to uh, give me the answer of this question, who was Kublai Khan? Then give me the answer of this question, name the cities visited by Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta. And the next thing which is very important which you all have to do is you have to tell me the reason that why Marco Polo traveled and how many years he waited for that, you know, journey. And you have to tell me the name of uh, Marco Polo book and Ibn Battuta book as well. And you can tell me that who wrote that book for them. Guys, at the end of the lecture, I would like to say that uh, please stay at home, stop playing outdoor games. Uh, it is better for you and for your families because this is the time when we have to take the things seriously. We have to consider this social distancing, you know, as an alarming situation for all of us. Please stay safe and stay at home. Thank you. Allah Hafiz.